This morning, I want to conclude our series, Rescue Stories. You may be seated. In just a few moments, you're going to hear from a guy named Josh. Goes to our church here. And uh, he's going to share his rescue story with you. And maybe this story today seems different. Maybe it's not like your story but it was never meant uh, to be your story this is his story but the author can be the same the Bible says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith what he can do for one he can do for you so I want you to watch this video now, hear Josh's rescue story. Hey Josh, thanks for being here uh, today, sharing your story. Uh, I think a lot of people are really going to benefit from hearing what God has done in your life, to hear your rescue story. So, thanks for being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I grew up in Waresboro. Uh, I had a really good childhood. Um, married my high school sweetheart at 18 years old. Around 15, I started messing around with marijuana uh, with my friends, you know, of course, being cool. That rocked on. Uh, we had a child. We had my son uh, at the age of 18. After that, I started uh, Messing around with a little bit harder drugs, whatever was cool at the time, whatever my friends was doing. Um, you know, we started messing with cocaine, and around 99, I OD'd on cocaine. And uh, straightened up for a couple years. Um, 2003, we had a beautiful baby girl. I started a business, uh, started Dependable Lawn Care on St. Simons Island. Um, everything was going good except my drug use. My drug use had escalated. I was keeping it kind of hidden. Everything looked good from the outside looking in, but it, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't at all. I was living in Brunswick. I was running my business. I was working seven days a week, uh, playing poker three or four nights a week, leaving my wife at home with the kids all the time. She got homesick, um, got ready to move back to Waycross, so I, Rented a mobile home trailer here in Waycross, and I kept the house and was going to live in it throughout the week and come home on the weekends. Well, that just made my drug use and everything skyrocket. And I was running my business in the dirt, whether I knew it or not. I didn't realize it at the time, but it's not taking care of things, not, 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 not living the way I was supposed to live. We moved back to Waycross. Uh, a couple months later, I was coming home on a Friday night, uh, come home from work and had a horseshoe tournament to go to. And I uh, come home and her and the kids was at the house and I told them, I got in the shower, told them bye, left about 8.30 and headed to the horseshoe tournament and pulled up to the red light and a guy tried to rob me. I didn't think he was gonna shoot me, he had a gun to me. And uh, I tried to pull off from him and he shot me right here in the, in the uh, shoulder. Well, at the time, I didn't really realize it, but it paralyzed me on this side of my body, and I drove myself to the hospital. Thank the Lord, he was with me. And I got to the hospital, and I passed out, and I woke up whenever they were dragging me out of the truck. You're, you're not saved at this time. I am definitely not saved at this time. I woke up in the hospital a few weeks later, and they told me that uh, I was paralyzed on the right side of my body, and that I'd probably never walk again. A couple months later, um, I walked out of the hospital. God had different plans for my life for me to be in a wheelchair. Six months later, I, the bullet broke my back. So it was a six months, I was about to go back to work. And I jumped on my bike, motorcycle, and I was high on pills and I wrecked and I lost my leg. This time when I got out of the hospital, a few months after that, I'd lost everything. My house, my business, my truck cars, four-wheelers, boat, like everything was gone. Help. Help. My leg, like I was, I was, man, I didn't, I was in bad, bad shape, mentally, spiritually, physically. And um, 
My drug use just got so bad because I got everything I wanted from the doctor then. I didn't have to go out and get it. Um, the only problem was is I couldn't pay my bills. I was living at home with my mom and dad, again, with my family of four, you know, after being an independent man since 17, raising a child since 18. A couple months later, I got my very first uh, marijuana charge. I was actually driving a stick shift truck with a cane and an antibiotic pump on my side, running into a pit line, out buying pot. <laughs> That's what kind of life I was living. So I got pulled over, got arrested, uh, bonded right out. Two months later, I got caught with several ounces of marijuana and a pistol. So that was a felony charge, and um, I bonded right out again. I hired a lawyer, kind of got out of it a little bit, and then back-to-back -back pill charges, boom, boom. I knew I needed help at this point. I knew that I, I knew I needed help. Like I was tired of, uh, uh, I was just tired. I was sick and tired. So I entered the drug court program, and it was a two-year program. Four years later, I decided I needed rehab. There was a guy in there, a buddy of mine, a crazy guy, you know, just do anything. Uh, was in there faking it till he made it. Got sent to this rehab, and he come back a changed man. I wanted what he had. And um, so I, I went. And um, I went with the intentions of giving my life to the Lord and seeking him, and that's what I did for six months. And God had been pulling on me for a while, and I'd just been ignoring it and ignoring it and ignoring it. Finally, I gave in, and I went, and everything was, man, it was, it was, <clears throat> it was the best life had been in a long time. So I, I graduated rehab. 2014, February 2nd, I graduated rehab. I went back to work. Uh, I was cutting grass for someone else. February the 4th, I get a phone call at work that my daughter got shot and killed. My kids were playing with a gun and I shouldn't have even been at my house because of the trouble that I'd been in. And from there, I got locked up for possession of a firearm by a convicted felon. Um, they let me out of jail to go to my little girl's funeral. And then I spent the next six months. When I should have been there for my wife and my son. So this kind of threw me for a loop spiritually, mentally. I didn't know what to, what to think. And I had, I had a couple preachers tell me that um, that was God testing my faith, and my faith was new, and I didn't understand that. Today I know that God was put me in that rehab and set me down and gave me a firm foundation to stand on whenever this happened. Because if I'd have been in my drug use, there's no telling what would happen. I started using again. I didn't go back to the hard drugs. I started using marijuana again. I went back to jail. This was a year and a half later. And while I was in jail this time, I told my wife, I only had 30 days in jail. I told my wife to bring me my Bible. <clears throat> and she was thrilled that, that I told her to bring me my Bible. So I started reading my Bible again. And, <clears throat> and someone had told me about about Remnant Church. The jailer or something, was it? Yeah. I think it was a jailer or something that had mentioned Remnant. Asked me if I had ever heard of it or whatever. It was a newer church. I hadn't been there for about a year. And uh, a lot of people was getting saved. And you know, it was really good. Well, I told my wife, I said, look, in a couple of months when I get out, there's a church I want to try. It's called Remnant Church. I said, OK, cool, you know, we'll try it. This was in uh, 2016, August 2016. I got out of, uh, a week before I got out of jail, I called home and my wife said, I was invited to Remnant Church by one of my friends. I want to go this weekend. I said, awesome, tell me how you like it. 
Well, she came home and she loved it. She said, next week, you mean get out, you gotta go try. I said, okay, cool. So we went, we met, I met you, you know, that day. And um, we've been here ever since. Uh, that's, when, that's when my life really started to change. That's when I started seeing my wife love the Lord. And that's really when I began to love the Lord again after that happened with her. We started going to New Believers right away. We got invited to New Believers, started going to New Believers. We learned who we was in Christ. We rededicated our lives to Christ here. We become members of the church. We become connectors and then we become connector leaders. Today, I sit here, I'm the director of Celebrate Recovery. I'm, um, I sit on the board of the church. I own a business. I just bought a new truck. I'm a home, we're homeowners. I'm blessed more than I deserve. Everything that I lost, that I gave away, that I allowed the, the enemy to take, God has restored. I'll never get my daughter back, but I can go where she's at. And that's our plans. And that's, that's what gives us hope. And through everything that we've been through, we realize that, that, that God's been there the whole time and we give him all the glory and this is our rescue story. Amen. I want you to stand with me all across the building this morning. I want you to turn in your Bibles or yeah. Turn in your Bibles while you're standing. Thank you, Josh. Galatians chapter 5. Now, I just want you to understand his story can be your story today. His story can be your story today. I want to read this. We're going to pray and then you're going to be seated. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Put it on the screen, guys. Verse 21. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Father, for the next few moments, God, I pray that you would speak to hearts and lives today. Have your way in this service, God. Let it be my words, my mouth, but your words. My mind, but your thoughts. Father, I ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. you may be seated this morning. Today I want to look at this scripture. Today I want to, and I, please, I'm going to ask you, and I'll ask just once, please keep the moving down to a minimum, okay? Today somebody can make a life-changing decision. So I, don't be a distraction today. Don't forget we've got nursery, we've got children's church, we make those available for you. Today I'm not playing games, I guess is what I'm saying. I'm meaning business today. Today there's, lots, there's, there's people's lives who hang in the balance. There's no joke on, on my part. There's no, uh, there's, this is not fun for me. I believe this is life or death for some people today. And that's just how serious I'm going to take it this morning. Paul writes, we are ambassadors, and then he says, since Christ is making an appeal through us. I want to take out those words, we and, and us, and take it and, and, and change it to I and me and make this personal. Today we're talking about rescue stories. And, and, and for, for you to be effective in witnessing to others, you've got to be able to share your story and what God has done for you. 
And the Bible says right here, therefore we, I, so take out we, I am an ambassador for Christ. If your life has been changed, if you've been saved, if you've been changed by the power of the gospel, then you are an ambassador for Christ. Christ. What is an ambassador? An ambassador is a, a designated representative authorized to speak in a foreign land on behalf of the country he is from. I'm an ambassador because this world is not my home. This is not where it stops for me. I, I am a person who belongs to another country. This world is not my home. Heaven is my home. And God has put a message inside of me. And I am employed by the Holy Spirit to be an ambassador for Him. To tell you something. And this is what I want to tell you today. You have not done too much. You have not went too far. You have not lived in sin too long. That God cannot change your life. What he done for Josh, he wants to do for you. No matter where you've been, what you've been through, God wants to restore and change your life. Therefore, I'm an ambassador for Christ. God is making his appeal through me. And I plead on Christ's behalf. And this is what I'm pleading today. Look at me. Look at me square in the eyes. This is what I'm pleading for you today. Get right with God. Amen. Be reconciled to God. God, stir a passion and fire in me, Lord, like you haven't in a long time. Oh, God, break my heart for what breaks yours, Lord. Be reconciled to God. Don't be comfortable with sin. Don't be comfortable where you're at. Get real with God. Be reconciled unto God. Make things right with God. You don't have tomorrow. You don't have next week. Oh, you say, I do. You don't know if you do. I'm begging you. I'm beseeching you, brother and sister. If things aren't right between you and God, break your neck to get to this altar today because you're not running to an altar. You're running to Jesus. to God that's my message that's what I'm saying cut it off that's what I'm saying be reconciled unto God this ain't about church this isn't about uh, uh, checking a box this is about making things right this isn't about bragging on church attendance this isn't about being baptized. Did you know hell enlarges itself daily? You know with who? You know that there's people that walk out of church and go straight into eternity in hell? Did you know that? You can deceive everybody else. You can deceive me. You can deceive your family. But you will never deceive God. You will never pull one on God. He knows everything about you. He knows what makes you tick, what makes you click. He knows every propensity you have. He knows every desire you have. He knows everything about you. But here's what blows my mind. He knows everything about you. But he is in love with you. And he doesn't need you. But he wants you. You want to hear the gospel? Listen to this. The next verse, verse 21 says this. He, God, made the one, the one who, Jesus. He made the one who did not know sin become sin for you and for me. So that through him and in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Who? Anyone who believes. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter how long you've done it. It doesn't matter how, how many times you fell on your knees and cried out to God. And said, God, if you 
just take this from me. God don't want to take just something from you. God wants everything of you. You want God to fix things in your life. But God doesn't want you to fix things. God doesn't want to fix things. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants all of you. Oh, friend, and when he gets all of you, then he'll begin to change some things in your life. Then he'll begin to part some waters and move some mountains, but not until you say, God, I give you my all. I echo the words of Paul. Be reconciled unto God. Understand now, this is not just a preacher thing. And you are an ambassador. Oh, yes, I am. If you're born again, so are you. You're to tell this story. You've been given the authority. You've been mandated by Jesus to tell people about Jesus, about him. You're in another world in another country saying have you tried Jesus have you made things right between you and God this is what God has called you to do you don't have to be a theologian you don't have to be a pastor or a preacher you just got to be understand what happened to you see we've all got a story Stephanie you got a story Josh you got a story you got a story Jamie, you've got a story. Keith, you've got a story. And what good's a story if it's not told? What good is a story if it's not told? What good's a testimony if it's not shouted from the hilltops? And I believe there's some people in here this morning who can say, I was headed towards hell. I was at the edge. But God rescued me. Tell your story. There's three things I want to talk about when it comes to telling your story. About evangelizing and sharing the gospel. So I want to talk to saved people. The first thing I want to tell you, I want us to look at Jude. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Look at Jude chapter 1, verse 21. I want to read this to you. I'm going to pull out three things that's so important for believers. God's not looking and uh, let me just get this out of the way. God's not looking for dead, dried up religious folk. Dead, dried up religious folk can't tell his story. But he's looking for people who've been empowered by his spirit. Who know what it's like to live in sin, but know what it's like to walk in victory. And some of you have been, the devil shut your mouth and muted your story and silenced your testimony. But this morning, by the grace of God, you're going to get up with a new shout. And you're going to get up telling a new story. You're going to get up with an urgency in your heart and your life. This is what Jude would tell us when we get to the last days, which I believe we're living in. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep it on your mind that you're where you're at because God loves you. No other reason. You should be dead. You should be wallowing in your defeat and in your sin. But God loved you. Keep it on your mind. Keep it in your heart. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting expectantly for the mercy of our Lord Jesus for eternal life. And while you're waiting, this is what he says. Verse 22, have mercy on those who waver. Uh, this is my first point, and this is it. If you're a believer, if you're a child of God, if you're saved today, you got to do this. Point number one, put it up, Billy. Have compassion on those who are struggling. This church is not for people who have it all together. Let me back up. Put it in reverse. Church, not just this church, is not for people who have it all together. People who have it 
altogether, they were never going to step into a church. They'll never be the church because they're full of their selves. They're full of pride. They don't think they need a Savior because they don't recognize they're a sinner. But this place is for people who know I can't even walk without him holding my hand. I can't make it without God. I'm here today because of the goodness of God. And when you understand that, and love is on the front of your mind, the love of God. Then it's easy to have compassion on those who are struggling. Because here in all honesty, aren't we all in some way or shape aren't we all struggling some are struggling with unforgiveness some of you are struggling in discipleship oh yeah you put on a good show but are you reading your word are you spending time with God Are you having devotion with him? Oh, wait, way to go. You're going to church. The scribes and the Pharisees go to church. The religious people followed Jesus everywhere he went. Some of you got unforgiveness. You're saved, but you're struggling with unforgiveness. I'm not bad as Josh. Oh, really? May the veil of religiosity be snatched off our eyes. I don't know when or how or what happened and how it happened. But I'm telling you, this place has never, sorry, you can't see me on video right now, but I'm at the doors of the church. This place has never been a place for people who think they don't need God or people who look down the nose of other people. No, when this church started, when it, before we ever had any asphalt and any butts in the chairs, I spent time at the altar of God with just a handful of people and we prayed and you know what our prayer was? Lord, send them. I don't care what they look like. I don't care where they've been. I don't care what they were at last night. I don't care who they hang out with. God, you hung up for them on the cross over 2,000 years ago. This is not a place for religious religiosity. This is a place where people come in, you can shut the door, come in broken and hurting and they they may not know how to get, they may not can walk to the altar, but if, if they got to crawl, you know what we do? We grab them by the arms and say, I'll help you get there. If they've got to drag themselves to the altar, uh, this is that kind of place. Come on. If we're not, I don't want to be here. This is not that kind of place. If this is not the kind of heart that you have, if this is not the kind of church that you want, go find another church. I was here before most of you were here. And this is what God has called us to do. It's who he's called us to be. We're going to have compassion on those struggling, not just those outside the walls. God, but even our brothers and sisters. Compassion doesn't stop when you get saved. I need compassion. I need mercy. I need com This ain't a place. I'm just going to take my time. This ain't a place of a second chance. This is a place of another chance. 
and another chance and another chance. And I, anybody know what I'm talking about? And another chance and another chance and another chance. And God's not done with you. Get back up and another chance. Hallelujah. I'm going to have compassion on those who are struggling. And when do we quit on them, Pastor? When soon as Jesus quits on you. You let me know when Jesus quits on you. And when he quits on you, then you can quit on them. But until then, while we're waiting, while we're waiting, I'm going to have compassion on those who are struggling. Then the verse goes on to say, I believe in verse 23. Have compassion on them. And then this, it says this, save others. By snatching them from fire. Here we go, round two. Snatch them. you got to grab them up. You got, what's that mean? You got to go after them. Let me tell you what, I, let, me, let me give you a little illustration. Stand right here. Let me give you an illustration. The prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. We know, we know all about the younger brother, but what about the older brother? The younger brother, you know what he done? He spent all his money that his daddy gave him on sin, sinful things. But he comes to himself. The Holy Spirit deals with him. He goes back to the Father. The Father wraps his arms around him. He loves him. He puts a robe on him. Puts a ring on his finger. Kills, come on. Kills the fat, fatted calf. Cooks a meal. Brings him into the house. Then it goes, switches to the older brother. The older brother, he had not left. He was at home. The Bible says he was working in the fields. And when he heard the music and dancing, the Bible says that the older brother got mad. His daddy said, why are you mad? And he said, I'm mad because I've been here all this time working for you. You never done anything like this for me. Never have I sinned against you one time. But that old other son of yours, that's what it says. He spent all your money with prostitutes. Stop. If he knew where he was at. Why didn't he go get him? Y'all don't want to hear that this morning. See, because I'm talking, I ain't talking about something I think is a good idea. I'm talking about something that I've done. You know where he's at. Why didn't you snatch him up and say, what in the, are you doing? Why are you, you going to come up with some kind of thing you can't wash off? Get back over here. The fault, do you understand what I'm saying? Snatch them up. Snatch them out of their sin. Some people, you got to do that. You got to have enough compassion on them not to leave them headed in the same direction, but to give them a detour and say, you know this is not who you are. You know you don't belong there. You are a child of God. And I went. I'm telling you something that I've done. But it ain't a preacher thing. This is a me and you thing. If you tell you love your brother and your sister, but you don't love them enough to get in the mud, you don't love them enough to find out where they're at, and you don't try with all your ability and your strength and the power of the Holy Ghost to snatch them out from where they're at, then friend, 
you ain't got to love. You got a convenient like. You like them when they're doing good. But God, give me a church full of people who will go find out where they're at, snatch them up by the nap of their neck, and say, this is not who you are. This is not, you don't belong here. What you are, or what you're doing is not who you are. Get back to the Father's house. Point number two, we have to be willing to go after those who are at the edge, snatching them from, are you listening to me, from the fire. And the verse goes on to say, the rest of verse 23 Save others by snatching them from the fire. Have mercy on others. But listen, but with fear, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. What is that saying? It's saying this, which is point number three. Love the sinner. Have compassion on them but don't make an excuse for their sin. Reject the sin, but help the sinner. Don't dance around it. Don't say it's just some character defect. That's how your parents were, so that's probably how you're going to be. No, or it's okay. It's not okay. In our compassion, in our snatching, we must remember we be tender. We're to be tender to the sinner, but not tender to sin. Reject the sin. Think about it in this manner. The writer Jude would say, even the f- garments that they were wearing when they sinned, just like the leper, and he wore his garments, you burned them. That's how serious it is. And that's how serious sin is. Don't for a minute think I'm saying be soft on sin. I'm saying you sin is a killer. Sin is a destroyer. Sin takes no hostages. Sin knows no mercy. Sin gives no grace. Sin ain't never helped nobody. Sin all he does it brings is damage and destruction and hurt and pain and strife and sorrow and isolation. That's all that sin does. But God came so that you might have life and life more abundant. So if you're a believer in here today and you're serious about building the kingdom, you got to be compassionate towards those who struggle. You've got to reject the sin and love the sinner. And you got to be willing to go to the edge and snatch somebody. As for Christians, but what about the person who's on the edge? What about the person who is on the edge? Look at me, you came in here this morning. You just, you don't even know why you came to church. You came to church because your wife wanted you to go. Or you came to church because somebody said they was going to meet you there. And they, you just here. You're just here. But you're not just here. Huh. That ain't how God works. Because I've been praying for you. I didn't know your name. I didn't know your story. But I've been praying. You know. I've been praying for you. And so that person who is on the edge, whether you're watching or you're in here this morning, I've got three things for you. And these are the three things. 
This is what you need to do. Don't need to do. Don't need to do if you're on the edge today. The first thing you don't need to do is wonder if this message is for you today. It is. You don't need to wonder and say, I don't know if I need this or not. I don't know if I need this Jesus. What Jesus? You talking about the Jesus that died for you? Are you talking about the Jesus that went, carried a cross that was meant for you? Endured the pain and the shame and the guilt? Was rejected? Ridiculed openly for you? When he hung on the cross and he bled, he bled for you? He didn't just die for us, he died instead of us? You talking about that Jesus? You don't think you need that Jesus who died for you? That Jesus who provided you rescue? That Jesus while he was on the cross, you were on his mind? That Jesus who loved you while you were yet a sinner? That Jesus? Wondering if he, if you need him? Well, he sure don't need you. This was never a thing out of obligation. This was a thing out of love. For God so loved me and you that he gave Jesus. So if you're wondering if this is for you, I'm telling you it is for you. This is the reason he died. You, you are the reason he died. He didn't die just for you. He died instead of you. So don't wonder today. You're wasting your time. Here's the second thing. Don't wrestle. I talked to Lisa today. Come here. Get out of scary end. Come on. You're telling me I do it every Sunday. It scares me to death. You know what Alicia said? Oh, it's okay. You know what she said? We were talking about, I said, I believe. She was out there with a sign today. And I said, I believe some people are going to get saved today. I believe it. She said, yeah, I do too. You know, I can spot them out. I said, you can? She said, yeah, because I used to be just like them. She said, she said, she said, I can tell because they start to get nervous and they grab onto the chair and they look kind of funny. Like they don't, when you start preaching, and you start, she said, you start giving that altar call. She said, I can tell who they are. I want to go up just to them and just say, hey, you know, he's talking to you. Hey, you know, you need to get saved. And I'm telling you, there's some people right now, you know what she's talking about? She can see in you, you wrestle, you're wrestling. And, and I'm telling you, don't wrestle today with the flesh. Don't, don't wrestle and say, well, I don't know if I need to go. Everything in your spirit saying go, but everything in your flesh is saying don't go. So you're grabbing hold of the chair until your knuckles are turning right white. But you ain't fooling God and you ain't fooling her today. Quit wrestling. Sit down. Sit down. Quit wrestling with God. Don't wrestle. Don't wonder. Don't re wrestle. Here's number three. Stand with me all across the building. Don't go nowhere. Stay right here. Please, this is life or death. Don't wonder, don't wrestle. Here's my third point. Are you ready? Don't wait. Do not wait. What are you waiting on? What would you wait for? You don't have the luxury to wait. You don't have the, I said you don't have the luxury to wait. I'll never forget a guy. When I was on staff as a music minister. There was this guy. I had not talked to him. I may have spoke to him. Now listen, listen, hold on just a minute. I may have spoke to him. I, I, I just can't remember, but I knew who he was. So I must have spoke to him. He had just started coming to church. I was on staff at another church. 
he wanted to talk to me the next week. I can't remember if he called the office or what. You know what happened? I call myself getting busy. And I put it off. I got another call. That same guy that was wanting to talk with me that week, later on that week, he blew his brains out. Young guy. He's probably my age then, so 20, 25, 26, somewhere in there. It was at that moment that I decided I can't. I don't have time to wait. You can't put nothing off. When it comes to spiritual matters, it just there's some things I can put off. I can put off some appointments, but when it comes to what I'm talking about right now, you can't wait. You know that's exactly what the writer Paul would say. After those verses I read, in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 5, you know it says we're ambassadors. And then he said, tell them, get things right with me. Be reconciled unto God. And then then the writer goes on to say he made the one who didn't know sin to be sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Well, the very next chapter, this is the next thing he says. Working together with him. I appeal to you, don't receive the grace of God. I want to say two more things. That's what he's saying. I want to say two more things. Don't waste God's grace. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. It would have been, it would have been better for you to have not even come here today. overdosed and died and went to hell than to hear this glorious gospel tread over the body of Jesus trample over the body of Jesus trample over the grace of God better for you to went to hell than to hear this gospel trample over the trample over the blood trample over the body of Jesus hear it not receive it and die it'll be worse for you hell will be worse for you hell will be worse for you I said hell will be worse for you hell will be worse for you because you know why in hell you'll think about the opportunities you had You'll think about the grace, this picture that I painted today of Jesus. You'll think about it. It'll torment you night in and night out, day in and day out. It'll torment you and you'll think about the opportunity. You had a chance, but you waited. You waited. There's people in hell today who waited. But you know what he said? He said, don't wait. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Next verse. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait. Why don't I wait? Because today's the day. Today's the day. Today's the day. I don't care how long you've been playing games. I don't care how long you've been trying to fool people. Trying to, it don't matter. All that all that's, doesn't matter. Some of you say, I'm almost saved. You're totally lost. 
Pastor, I'm almost saved. I'm a good person. No, you're not. There's no such thing as a good person. Jesus said it of himself. There is no good. The Bible tells us our goodness is as filthy rags. You think I stand up here because I'm good? You think I stand up here because I got it all together? No, I stand up here. I stand here. Because I'm being prodded and pushed. Rescue is for you. I'm not standing here a good person. I need Jesus every day. A lot of people tell me, they'll say things like, Pastor, you're th- this ministry saved my life. You're preaching saved my life. You've done this. You've done that. And I know I didn't. Do you know me? You don't even know me. I like Paul who said, Oh, wretched man that I am who will save me and deliver me from this body of flesh. I'm not standing here before you and preaching because I'm perfect. I'm preaching to you today because I've met a man named Jesus and he accepted me and he brought me in and he brought me into the family and he erased all my failures and all my sin. Forgave me every sin that I had ever. all the time pretty much because I take God at his word and I believe today's the day and I may never get another chance to stand before you and you may never get another chance to hear the gospel I just don't know this world's too big for me to understand it and God's too magnificent and great for me to try to time him out I don't know what he's going to do but I know I'm here and you're here God's here. And I want to ask you this morning. If you don't know Jesus like I'm talking about. If you don't know Jesus in the way that I'm preaching today. If you were to take your final breath on this earth where would you spend eternity where 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 some of you have been working really hard to be a better person and how's that working for you it don't work does it you want to lay it down but you pick it up you lay it back down and you pick it back up how's it working for you God isn't in the business of remodeling you. He's in the business of making a brand new you out of you. The old's the problem. He's not trying to fabricate or refresh. He's in the business of making a brand new you out of you. Father God, right now in the name of Jesus, Good preaching doesn't save a man. Well-rehearsed sermons doesn't save a man. God, if somebody gets saved today, it's because you're drawing them. Father, draw them now. Draw them now. Draw them now. God, I don't know who will walk out of here and never walk back in. I have no clue. You do, God. I don't know the next person I might see. The next time I might see somebody in here might be looking at them. In a casket, God. Lord, there's men coming already right now. God, because you're drawing them. Holy Spirit, draw them. Holy Spirit, go after them. Holy Spirit, rescue them. Holy Spirit, rope them and drag them to this place. Let me tell you something today. Let me tell you something today. You know, let me say something to you. If you feel the Spirit of God drawing you, what else in this world could be greater than that there are billions of people on this earth right now God is dealing and drawing 
you. He's, you feel him pulling you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Have you felt the drawing of the Holy Ghost before? The Father of God drawing you? You feel that today? Give me some men around this man right here. And I want to ask you right now, as God's moving, is there somebody else today, man or woman? God is drawing right now. If you don't know Jesus today, if you don't know God today, why God's moving, why God's here, I'm asking you, would you step out today? 